Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Lynda.com. Learn what you want when you want with access to over 2,000 high quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. And by Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus lets you binge on thousands of hit shows anytime, anywhere on your TV, PC, smartphone, or tablet. Visit huluplus.com slash knowhow to start your free two-week trial. That's huluplus.com slash knowhow. Today you'll know how to organize your RIP DVDs, and then you'll know how to make power from fire. Well, actually, not am. Technically, I am wrong. He's a drug and maniac. Like Bye, I am. You should be watching the drop cam. If you're a good fan, you'd know that. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Know How. This is Twit's how-to show. We give you a fun project or two to show you something you could do on a, at least my project's about a rainy day weekend. Padre, you've got a project about you'd, fire you'd today. You definitely want you know water around just in case. Yeah, yeah. so if, if, you're, if you've watched this live, you've seen me running a lap. I'm always out of breath at this point, so we should check out what's making the news today. Let's do that. All right, so in the news today, there's a great a couple of stories about Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's this awesome Kickstarter project called Cano, and it's reached its funding goal of $100,000. Now, its goal was to make the Raspberry Pi as simple as a Lego product. Cano says there isn't a simple and easy way to get into the Pi, so they came up with this device. You can learn how to code right from the start. Games like Snake and Pong is built right in. Yeah, I like this idea because as much as we enjoy the Raspberry Pi, I mean, we built a main machine built on the Raspberry Pi, it could still be a little daunting for the person who just wanted to first get into the microprocessor world. So the fact that they're making it as easy to assemble as a Lego and they are really making a game out of it, maybe that will inspire the next generation of programmers. Yeah, the thing is, they, they've showed the Raspberry Pi, you buy the device, it's pretty much bare bones. And the thing about making it a usable device, we've had things like cases and case mods, this is supposed to make it real easy, and they've reached their goal with 28 days to go. So they've Not made bad. more than double. And you guys should be happy to know that the Raspberry Pi is going to get Wolfram language and Mathematica available for free on the Raspberry Pi. For me, I, first I saw this article, I was like, Math Mathematica, isn't that a really powerful thing that's going to crush the Pi? Doesn't look like it's going to be the case. No, you, you could actually have them living with each other. I mean, the, the nice thing about these interfaces and this hardware is that they're, they're finally coming together so that if you've got one, you can play with the other. And that's, that's ultimately what we want, right? We don't want someone to have to choose what platform they're going to use and then they're forever stuck on that. We want them to go back and forth and use each tool when appropriate. So this lets us do that. So we've got to do, though, we've got to do a project where we actually cluster a bunch of pies so we can make it the ultimate mathematical machine. A pie cluster. Yes. Cluster pie. A cluster of pies. Mm. Anyway, mm. we could bake a pie on, on heat, I'd imagine. Yes, we, we wanted can. to. So we should get to this first project, Padre. We've got fire. I'm going to start calling you Father Firestarter today. I am the Firestarter. He's the Firestarter. Twisted uh, Firestarter. We're going to need to spike your hair up a little bit, but I, I like it. So we're, we're, what are we going to do today with thermocouples? Okay, so we got an email a while back from a viewer who said, uh, look, I like your episodes, but I want to see you do stuff with used gear I might have around my house. So with so you that went in to mind, the guy's house. I went to his house good, and I, good I stole idea. all his stuff. No, all right. But so this, this is made entirely of stuff that I just had in my gearboxes. Uh, this is from an old PC. I've got a couple of parts here from a, a cooler, uh, one of those, those TECs, the thermoelectric coolers like this. This is one of those USB coolers that uh, you plug into your computer and it gives you a cool surface to, to cool your drink. So I can Actually, keep my, my soda can on this all day. It'll keep yeah. my drink nice and cool. So, and like, for example, if you go ahead and feel that for a while, tell me when it starts to get cold. It's getting a little chilly right now. Yeah, so and this is all off of 5 volts. Mm -hmm. This is a, a TEC, which is going to be the, the principle on which we're going to build all of our product. The projects. bottom's getting hot. The bottom gets hot, right, because 
and I'm going to explain how the Seebeck effect works, how the Peltier effect works. Now, the cool thing about something like this, a project like this, is again, you probably have a TEC and you don't even know it. You don't have to be a super high-end overclocker if you've got one of those refrigerators that runs in the car. If you've got a toy that keeps your soda cold, that's most likely running off of a thermoelectric cooler. And that's what we're going to use to turn fire into power. How about that? Okay, so how do we identify the thermoelectric uh, cooler in the actual device? What right. does it look like? They all look like this. This is a TEC. Uh, th uh, now, the nice thing about this is the labeling is universal. If you look, it always says TEC, and then it, you have a three did, uh, a number, a three number uh, sequence here, one, two, seven. That tells me that there's 127 thermocouples in here. Now, you remember from episode 65, we talked about what a thermocouple is, right? You run heat through a junction between two dissimilar metals and you get a little bit of voltage. Problem is the voltage is so little that it's very difficult to do anything with it. It's like millivolts. Is 127 a lot, not, not enough for what we want to do? Like what's, what's a really like high number, what's a low number, and what does right. 127 mean? 127 is pretty average. I mean, you see that a lot in consumer products because it gives you either enough cooling or enough electrical generation to get the job done. But there are higher end modules that can fit as many as 300 thermocouples into the same space. What kind of device would you take apart to find that? Do you have to, or do you just have to buy that separately? Uh, I, I would buy that separately just okay. because you're probably going to pay too much of a premium if you find that in a consumer device. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you can find these at Amazon. This is 99 cents. These are really, really inexpensive because they're everywhere now, right? Now, the, the, the last two digits are important too because that tells you how much current flows through the thermocouple, how much, how much power you can pump through it. This can take, as you see, that's two, but I've got another thermocouple here that brings me up to six. So the, larger, the higher the number, the more power you can pump through it. Conversely, the higher the number, the more power you can get out of it when you're pushing heat. Okay, so how do we build something to generate right. electricity? Well, I think for that, first I have to explain one quick thing about the Seebeck effect and the Peltier effect. Now, the Seebeck effect is essentially the same thing as the, the thermocouple. It's two dissimilar metals. You push heat through it. You have a hot side and a cold side. And as heat moves through the couple, it's going to generate a current. The Peltier effect is the reverse of that. If you pump current through that exact same device, it will force heat from one side to the other. So that's why on a device like this, this is the one that you just held up, there's a switch back here that actually lets you switch between hot and cold. You can go between the hot side and the, and the cool side just by reversing the polarity. That's the same principle that we're going to use to turn these candles into usable uh, electricity. Okay, so we've got... We got this. We got the actual knowledge. We understand yeah. why it's working. Let's build it. Let's build let's something. Build out of, let's, let's, let's take some fire and harness it. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So first, you hold on to that. That's the the thermocouple. Uh, you're gonna need a heat spreader. A lot of people bypass this step and they just put heat directly onto the thermocouple. Don't do that. That's gonna lead to a lot of inefficiency. I'd it's imagine. very inefficient. And the problem with this is they have a very low melting temperature. So if you got a hot spike you could melt all the thermocouples in that area and then it kills the efficiency of the module. So what are you using as a heat spreader? Is that just a piece of metal? This is just a piece of aluminum that I drilled out to match a heat sink. So the thermocouple is going to go on top of this thing so that any heat will be evenly distributed over either side of the thermocouple. Now I should mention, it doesn't matter which side is the hot side, which side is the cold side. If you, if you flip it, the voltage will just be reversed on the, on the leads. But it, you know, hot side, cold side, there is no such thing. Okay. Okay. Now, you want this. That thermal paste? Thermal paste. Anyone who's done overclocking is going to know what this stuff is and why you want to use it. You can see I've spread it over this heat sink. You want a really thin coating. You really don't want that much. This is actually probably too much because I, I did it in a rush. But the idea is this is going to fill in all those little gaps, all the little valleys, so that there's really good contact between the surfaces. Now, onto that surface, you're going to want to go ahead and mount that thermocouple. And so once you've got that, your assembly should look something, and if you could go back to my wide shot, like this. See, I've got a heat sink on top of the, uh, the, the thermocouple, and on top, oops, oh, I messed that one up, and now I just broke that. That's okay. So we're going to sandwich this together. It's like making s'mores. Exactly. Yeah, we're making s'mores here. All right, good. So we've got our graham it, crackers and we've got it our... creates something like this. This will be my hot side. Mm -hmm. This will be my cold side. Now, 
Sometimes you have an application where you can keep the cold side cold with like running water. That's actually what I did in my lab back in San Francisco. The hot side was exposed to a hot water tap. The cold side was exposed to a cold water tap. We don't have a tap on set, so I'm using a fan. I'm gonna use a fan to simulate this. But the thing is though, this technique and all the stuff we're talking about could be applied pretty much anywhere you have a heat dif differential. Exactly. As you're talking about with your hot and cold running water, because that's pretty much everywhere in your house, harnessing that wasted energy. But for this demo purpose, we're gonna show you using a fan. Right, so it's all about the delta T. So if Brian will go ahead and run that, that uh, B-roll, this is a, uh, a BioLite camp stove. Now, the, it works on the exact same principle. This is a thermoelectric generator. It uses that heat pipe, that little rod you see sticking up from the flame pit, to push heat down into a thermoelectric generator, which is just, just like that ceramic thing that I just showed you. And on the other side, you've got a fan so that it cools it off. So you have a, a constant flow of heat from the hot side to the cold side. And as it does that, as that heat moves from the hot side to the cold side, it's gonna generate electricity. And that electricity can be then harnessed in uh, that, there's a little USB port in the back of the, uh, the BioLite for you to charge your phone or your lights, uh, whatever it may be. Now, the important thing is that fan, because if you don't keep the Delta T, if you don't keep that difference in temperature high enough, the power will stop flowing. Uh, so we, we're gonna cheat a little bit. This, this again, this is the, uh, professional, high-grade, consumer-level thermoelectric generator, but we're gonna use this. Now, Brian, if you cut to the side shot, this is a little thermoelectric generator that uh, we just muxed up here in, in a bit. It's using a heat sink, one of these, as the heat spreader, and if you uh, cut over into the, the overhead shot, it's got two candles. These are just little votive candles, so you know not a whole lot of heat. In fact, you could probably, you actually wouldn't burn yourself all that much. Now, that heat, is gonna hit this heat sink right here on the side, and then it's uh, gonna rise through the, th the two thermocouples that I sandwich in between, which I have run in series. So I'm actually combining their voltage. Uh, that's important because if you run it in series, you can combine their voltage. You run it in parallel, you combine their amperage. Right. right? So you, it depends on what kind of application you're doing. Uh, then it's gonna hit, the heat's gonna rise into this heat sink, which has this little fan, which blows the heat away. Now, I should notice that we are cheating. We're cheating because I've got a battery back here that's running the fan on top of this. That's it, it, not trying to, to trick people. It's just because we're on a limited time. Normally, it would take way too long for this to heat up to the part where we need it. If we had a large enough heat source, we could have the fan itself powered by it? Correct, yeah. So I, I've actually made a four thermocouple assembly, mm -hmm. and it generates enough heat to power the fan, which cools down the, the thermocouples, uh, and then also gives you excess power. So that's, uh, that's the ideal situation. And you really need about four. Four is about the break-even point. At four thermocouples, you get about five volts out, which will give you enough voltage to run a fan that's, that's enough, that gives you a high enough airflow to cool off the heat sink, and enough power to, say, charge a USB device. Now, as you can see, we're starting to get power out of the thermocouple. Oh, hold on. And so you've got this attached to an LED, and that's what's going to show us if we've got actual energy coming through this. Now, we've got some wires. I know we've been messing with this throughout yeah. the day, so uh, I don't worry about it. We can put this together. I don't think it's, it's not hot it's enough It's not hot yet. enough? It it's, could be. Maybe the air conditioning is messing with us today. I mean, I'm getting a tiny bit of power out of there, but not. An, I mean, we were, we were doing this before the show, and this was not. I mean, you can kind of see some brightness. There is, there's a glimmer yeah, of light in there. Yeah, there's a glimmer of light, but it's, I mean, we actually had it pretty bright. See, and again, this is the problem that we're gonna have, which is, it, it takes a while. This right. is not an on or off thing. It's gonna take about a full three minutes before this, this thermocouple gets hot enough to provide enough voltage. But let me show you in the meantime, if you cut to the overhead shot, this little voltmeter, it's gonna, I'm gonna show you what it looks like individually. So this, is what I'm getting off of one thermocouple. So I'm getting about 0.78 volts or so. That will go up to about 1.5 when it reaches uh, full temperature. And I'm getting uh, yeah, about 0.79 off of the other one. Now together, I'm gonna be pulling 1.5 volts. When this hits full heat, this should be running at about three volts, which would be more than enough to power this LED. So we've got an LED that will be lit. It just takes time. It's heat-based. It takes based. time. It's heat-based, so yeah, it all depends on how much. And I actually, I think my candles burned kind of uh, down. Oh, your candle. Yeah, so we, we were messing with this earlier to test it, of course. And we burned out We're going to need more votive candles or a blowtorch. Yeah, actually, something wacky. hold on. Do you want to just... Let's go crazy here. Shall we? 
Yeah, let's go crazy. Yeah, why not? Okay. So it's also a very good Prince song, I might add. Let's go crazy. Oh, did I just kill my mic? No. Wow. <laughs> simulating the heat. We're simulating heat. Okay, now see, it is getting a lot brighter now. Yeah. So if we so can, go ahead and we can and, lower the lights. We can see the power of and heat. go to the side view. And it's it's actually enough to to set things on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, there we go. There Sweet. we go. We've got a green light. And of course, all you snarky folks in the chat room are mentioning you can have lights that are, well, the candle could light this. We're just showing it for a demo. Exactly. This showing it for demo because you've got to remember the, the setup that I have back in my, in my house is running off of the, the, the water taps because mm -hmm. there's hot water tap and a cold water tap. So it's pulling heat out of a system that is most of the time just sitting there, which means there is no fan, which means there's no flame, which means that's normally heat that just gets radiated away as waste heat. I'm actually turning it into something that's useful. So where else can we put this in? We could do just like with probably like a stove, uh, like a stove, right. a uh, chimney. Uh, what other applications in a home could you use this? Right. So uh, uh, there's been great applications that use this on wood stoves. If you put this on the exhaust of a wood stove, you're pulling heat out of that exhaust before it makes it to the outside air. It actually works really, really well. Um, another application that I wanted to do is I wanted to hook this thing up to a solar charger. This is a solar charge controller. And then add a couple of solar panels with the idea being, look, you want multiple sources of power. When the sun is shining, you could charge a battery with this. When it's not shining, it'll go ahead and charge off of the thermocouple. And then you have a, a power storage device so you can pull power when you want it, not just when you're generating. So you're gonna store it to a portable battery. Yeah, exactly, stores. exactly. Now again, the, the, the reason why we showed you this is not because, oh, this is something that's gonna turn the energy industry upside down. But it's, it's something you could do with parts you probably already have. And if you don't have it, I mean, again, these thermocouples are about 99 cents a piece. If you wanted to get an actual thermoelectric generator, that's a much higher melting temperature thermocouple, you could get those for about 30 bucks. But uh, go ahead and play with it. Who knows, maybe you are gonna make power from fire. That seems absurd. It does work. I'm gonna mess with this myself. I don't know what I'm gonna mess with. I used to have a, when I was living in Vermont, I used to have a big stove and that would heat the entire house. I could have used this a lot for right. my, back in then, by the way, the iPhone was not available in Vermont because Vermont didn't even have singular. This is the old, old days. Uh, oh, by the way, so right now? I, uh, the heat sink is running about uh, 99 degrees or so, now 97 degrees. And the, the door on the side of the brick house is running around 84 degrees or so. So technically, I could slap a couple of thermocouples on the side of the building and just generate power off the waste heat coming into the studio. I like that idea. We could have our, all our lights, well, at least not all our lights. We could have a couple of LEDs yeah. lit up. Why not? Why not? Or it could be a USB power station right there. It's free power. Well, kind of free, if you have the stuff. All right, we should take a break and thank our friends at lynda.com. They're an online learning company. I know you guys know about them. If you watch Know How, we talk about them all the time. They help anyone learn creative skills, software, business skills to achieve your personal or your professional goals wherever uh, you are. With a lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to a huge library of high quality current and engaging video tutorials across a wide variety of subjects. So if you're into software, they got things for Excel, Dreamweaver, even WordPress if you want to go online and set up your blogs. For your hobbies, if you like shooting DSLR video like Brian does, if you want to get as good as him, you can learn that kind of stuff at your leisure. Programming as well, if you want to make websites work on apps, they've got courses for that. And there are a couple of courses I'm taking currently. Uh, I'm actually editing a new show that I'm working on and I'm messing with Premiere for Final Cut Pro, but they add courses at lynda.com every week. So there's over 2,000 courses in total. The new courses added this week included Lightroom 5, new features, up and running with studio strobes, GarageBand for Mac, new features, and overcoming procrastination. Now, I watched the overcoming procrastination video. This is a series, it's 19 minutes and one second. This thing is actually built for the procrastinator, and the instructors, in this particular case, is Brenda Bailey Hughes of the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. So the instructors involved in all of these courses are, they are working professionals at the top of their fields. I'm telling you, this 20 minute presentation was fantastic. It's actually broken up into separate chapters. So if you don't have the time to spend 19 minutes and one second to watch the whole presentation at once, you can just add it to a playlist because lynda.com's got playlists. You can bookmark things. And since, since they have apps for mobile, you could start on your desktop. Let's say you're at home 
watching the procrastination thing like I was, then you go off at the bank and you're waiting in line. You could go to your phone, pick up where you left off with these courses. And this is a really great course. I, I, I watched the whole thing. It was, it was really well done. And I've learned some techniques uh, that you guys should check out at lynda.com. The quality of video is fantastic. State of the art studios. And when you're learning about something like procrastination or how not to do it, it's always good to have somebody who is a working professional telling you about it in a well-lit, well-mic studio. Because otherwise you're not like, so stop being so lazy and do the... It's very, very well produced. I love it. Uh, the content's curated. Each lynda.com course is carefully structured so that users can learn from start to finish. Or you can jump from chapter to chapter for quick answers. They've even got searchable transcripts that allow you to search inside of a video. It saves you time. Find exactly what you're looking for. The courses are all over the place in level. So if you're a beginner, you can learn some stuff. If you're intermediate, there's stuff there too. If you're an expert, there's even courses for you there. You can, like I mentioned before, you can start on your desktop. You can watch on a tablet, move to your mobile device. It's all synced up for you. It's only $25 a month for access to Linda's entire course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project using the exact same assets they're using to teach you. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash know-how to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash know-how. And we thank lynda.com for their support of know-how. Really great course. Brian, do you want to use the, the Overcoming Procrastination course? No. no? I don't know if you hear that. He does not have time to procrastinate. So that's always it's good. It's a really, really good segment, and I've been meaning to watch it. I'll get to it eventually. That's the thing. Add it to your playlist. Yeah. You can get to it. Uh, yeah, but my, the project I'm going to show you guys is about organizing uh, your media center because, you know, it was a really rainy week here in California, and I just needed to sit down and really take care of stuff. So we're going to show you what it takes to organize your DVD collection. Now, if you guys have been watching this show, you have this idea that I really love Media Center. I like sitting on my butt and watching TV. Now what happened though, I got really spoiled. You go to iTunes or Netflix or Amazon, everything has beautiful cover art and they have descriptions and years and genres and information and information. My old catalog of DVDs that I had on my server, they just, they were not cutting it because I'm not gonna go into Batman the Animated Series, Volume 1, Disc 1, and then drag and drop a folder, Video TS. What is this, the Stone Age? So, what I'm going to show you is a rainy day project. You can probably see some, some moisture on my glasses because it's raining outside. Uh, I'm going to show you how to organize your movies for Media Center. Now, we're going to use something called My Movies, which is an application or plugin for Media Center. It also has plugins for XBMC and a whole bunch of other options, including OS X. So, let's go and show you that. I've been using this plugin for years. It's available at mymovies.dk. And what you do is you just hit download. And you go ahead and download My Movies for Windows 7 or 8 Media Center. There's also uh, collection management that you need. You can also do this for OS 10 if you want to. We're not going to show you the OS 10 version because I don't want to use the OS 10 version, quite honestly. We're going to run the My Movies collection management here. This is an application that you get when you download the actual My Movies app. You can see it takes a couple seconds to load. And what I already have is a pre-populated list of all the titles I've added. Now, you can see here, because it's the free version of the app, it says limited application functionality. It tells you all these things you can get for points. I have found that it's not necessary to upgrade to the purchase edition. If you, I have found it's not necessary to upgrade from the free version. However, if you want things like 720p fan art in the background, then it's worthwhile, maybe even 1080p, but I have been fine the way it is. So I'm going to say later. I don't want to look at this. And you can see all these titles. I have spent an enormous amount of time going through my DVD collection and adding these in. I'm going to show you how to do that for a television show called Batman the Animated Series, one of my favorites of all time. One of the things you could do to add titles is you can do this by barcode. So if you have the DVDs, you can actually input them this way. You can actually use my movies as a DVD manager for your physical discs if you want to, but we don't have to do that because we've ripped our DVDs. 
By the way, I'm assuming you watched our episode on how to rip DVDs and you put them on your server already. So we're gonna take the rip DVDs we have of our Batman the Animated Series. I bought the whole collection and what I did was I ripped them to my server, but I wanna access them on my media center and that's what we're doing right now. All right, so we're gonna go to the import folders tab here. We're gonna hit browse and we're gonna find where we ripped our DVDs. Now in my case, I've done this in my Pogo plugs. I'm gonna go to Pogo plug here. I'm gonna to go to Seagate Backup Plus Disk, because that's the name of it, really bad name, never retitled it. Video Library, as you can see, I've got things organized already, DVD Library, and Batman the Animated Series. So what I can do is I can select the folder. I'm not sure if this one works, but we're gonna find out. Inside that folder is the first four discs of season one of, or volume one of Batman the Animated Series. Hit Import, and we're gonna see what happens here. If my movies finds accurate data, what it's going to do is going to pre-populate a lot of this information for us. It looked like my movies froze, but don't fear, it does work. Maybe it's my machine and it's a little bit old. It's a, it really is a vintage PC at this point, I gotta say. Maybe my movies works faster on one of your other machines, but you can see it's importing the data. And you can see in the background, we actually have the cover art for Batman the Animated Series. So once it's imported the information, it will tell you a result, folder import result. It says added with data, it shows me uh, Batman, it says the directory, it's got the path, you can see a long path where this, this information is located. It's got a couple of disks, that's good. We're gonna hit okay, looks good to me. Now, now it's showing me X-Men United, why? Because this thing's out of order. I'm gonna go find Batman because I wanna curate this a little bit. Now if you ever notice on any of these IMDB entries, you see imdb.com slash title slash TT and a number. This is actually a number you can use if you want to populate data in my movies. That goes right here, IMDB. I just paste it in. And if I want to hit uh, refresh, I can refresh this if I want to. Not a big deal. Now, let's go and find some information. Where are our disks? When we go to our My Movies thing, we're going to find where our movies are in the plugin. It sounds a little confusing, but it'll make more sense in a couple of seconds. So, Disk one says online folder, and we have a path here. Video library, disk four. Now something went wrong, take a look at this. Now this says disk one, the path says disk four. That would be incorrect. So what we're going to do is we're gonna correct this. I've had this bugginess happen before. Now whether it's a function of my convoluted system of organization, or it's a function of my movies, I'm not quite certain. I'm sure you guys are gonna let me know. Uh, give us an email at knowhow at twit.tv if you've had similar experiences. Disc two, as you can see, you can see why I decided to make this a rainy day experience. Disc two seems to be missing, location, we're gonna hit this. Disc two, select, and we're gonna repeat. I know this is exciting, folks. I know that for sure. This one, disc three says it's offline. Well, that's not true, online folder. Trust me, I did this for my entire Simpsons catalog and that is over 11 seasons of discs. I'm gonna do disc four. Make it online, pick disc four. As you can see, we're in the right path, Batman the Anime Series, volume one, disc four. Hit select folder, and we're gonna hit okay. Before you leave my movies, there is something that's kind of neat about it. It's a feature, I call it, real, I call it a feature because it teaches you to be very, very thorough. If you don't hit save title down here, it will not save anything you do. It does not warn you that you have made changes. So save title, please save title, please save title. Now, if I fire up Media Center, I should be able to see Batman the Animated Series in my collection. So if we go into Batman, we see we have 28 episodes. Okay, good. All seasons. Now, it actually has all seasons, so we can see all the episodes, or season one. If we had multiple seasons, you'd see multiple seasons here. Here is some fun things about Batman the Animated Series. Now, in theory, you have a episode guide on the left. If I hit one, I should be able to go right to that episode. Sounds great, right? But Batman the Animated Series, get this, is a special case. This is the broadcast order. So if you keep an eye on this date here, 9-5, 9-6, 9-7, 9-8, 9-9, What happened is when Fox broadcast these episodes, they broadcast them out of order. So the order on the DVDs doesn't match the broadcast order. So the information IMDB fed my movies is not accurate for this particular show. Now, The Simpsons, this is, a, this is not an issue. For The Chappelle Show, it's not an issue. For a number of other shows, it's not an issue. But for Batman the Animated Series, it is. 
And now I get to show you how to fix that because this was driving me crazy. So I'm gonna close out of this and go back into my movies. You can see a little plus minus. We're gonna hit plus for Batman the Anime Series Volume 1. We're gonna hit plus again. Then we have Season 1. And you can see the episodes. Now, what's interesting is if you click one of the episodes, you'll be greeted with a new screen. It shows you season one, absolute number, and episode. The absolute number is actually the number that corresponds to the DVD. So what you have to do for something like Batman, if you want, if you are somebody who wants to make sure their collection is proper, you gotta go in and change these. You're gonna change that to 13, and you're gonna hit save episode. And then you're gonna do it again on Leather Wings. This is actually episode one. One, you can hit save episode, and so on and so forth. And we're gonna back up our database just in case of failure, because if you have that database and all your paths remain the same, you'll be able to import that to another machine. Uh, I wanna take a look real quick at the episode information you have here. You get a description of, of the episode, you get the guest actors, it turns out this episode of Batman has Elizabeth Moss of Mad Men fame, Michael Gross from Family Ties. All this information will be put in your uh, media center. All right, so we've changed all the episode numbers. Now we're gonna go to Batman the Anime Series up here in this tree. We're gonna hit Save Series. And we're gonna go up one more time, Batman the Anime Series, hit Save Title uh, for our voodoo. We're waiting for this progress to continue. And then we're gonna open up Media Center and see what happens. So we've added Batman the Animated Series. We're gonna go into TV Series, go to TV Series Library, and we should have Batman there. Great, we got Batman. We're gonna hit Enter, gonna move it along. There's actually an all seasons option and another option for all the other episodes. We're gonna pick On Leather Wings, and as you can see, there's all this metadata that's been scraped from IMDB and other resources. We've got the actual air dates of the episode, 9692. You can see that changed, 9792. Man, these are old but they were really good. You can see all this information about the synopsis and the guest actors there. So we're gonna go on Leather Wings. So what should happen now is we're going to go to the episode. We didn't go to the DVD menu. We went right to the episode and we're gonna see if we actually have the right one. The title sequence is finally finished and did we get the right title? Please be, yes, on Leather Wings. To show this is actually the DVD, I can show you that if I go to controls and go to title menu, I should go back here it is, the actual DVD menu. So I still have the ability to access the DVDs, the special features that I had before, uh, but what I get with my movies is a nifty episode guide on the left, and these are the broadcast order. Now, if you're a purist, you might get a little irritated to say, hey, why is that not the actual order that's on the DVDs? But this is actually how they were broadcast on Fox. Why they changed it, I don't know. But you can see these little eyes here show that things have been mapped to a disc that's there. I did not include all the discs just yet because I'm going to mess with this a little bit more. Now, for the most part, when it comes to something like Batman the Animated Series or some other shows, they have these unique titles, so you don't have to do a lot of tweaking with these things. But when I was putting in movies like Bedazzled, uh, if we look over here, let's find Bedazzled. This is actually the remake. I had to go in, I had to go find the other IMDB code. As you can see here, like I showed you that T number, if you put in the IMDB code for the new one, this information will populate as opposed to the original version. Uh, that's, what's, that's what my movies thought it was. So you might have to tweak these things as the day goes on. The whole point of this, this tedious work, this hard work, is so I can sit down, be lazy, and watch Batman. You know, it is the season. Let's go find Christmas with the Joker, one of my favorite things. Christmas with the Joker, okay. Got my Harmony remote here, so just kind of chill out. I'm gonna hit play. And now I'm watching Batman. Now I have a three terabyte library. I spent two hours uh, working on my library to clean that up because I cannot stand seeing just the wrong album art or not getting that metadata, just completely spoiled. And watching the back of that video, I realized my apart my house is a mess. I need to clean that up. Uh, but yeah, so you, you, do you do anything similar to your libraries? Uh, yeah, I do. I get, I get very OCD about that. You know, I need the album art. I need the title. I need all the information so that I could just scroll through it. And uh, you know, I don't always don't always do it right. So maybe. Uh, I need IAS, not the IAS I deserve, <laughs> but the IAS I need. UJ is right in the chat room. 
It's hard work being lazy. <laughs> it really is. Uh, let's take another quick break and thank another sponsor, Hulu. Dot com. You probably have tried out Hulu.com. Hulu Plus is so much more. With Hulu Plus, you can watch your favorite shows anytime. You can watch hit shows and movies in your living room or on the go with a smartphone or tablet. Now, Padre's actually in my Hulu Plus app uh, on my iPad. And the way I use it, like I heard about a show on TNT. Uh, Tom, in passing, mentioned the Goldbergs, which is kind of like the Wonder Years in, in an 80s kind of setting. So it's, I thought it was pretty funny because I was able to catch up with the episodes of Goldbergs on Hulu Plus. I didn't have to set up any scheduled recordings. I didn't even know what network it was on. All I had to do was a quick search, and there it was on Hulu Plus. And I could start it on the app. I could move to Apple TV. I could go pretty much anywhere I wanted because the Hulu Plus app is on so many devices. By the way, I got to say the Hulu Plus app is really well designed. It's gotten a lot better when it comes to searching for things. And you can see Padre's playing around. We got some videos and trailers sh showing. You got some clips from the Sesame Street parodies, which are very popular these days. I, I heard there's one about uh, Sons of Anarchy. They call it Sons of Poetry. <laughs> uh, very totally different kind of feel. You can also watch your favorite TV shows. Jimmy Kimmel Live, Shark Tank, Family Guy, SNL, Bob's Burgers, one of my favorites. Uh, you can also watch every episode like of, of shows like Lost, Doctor Who, Community, and Star Trek. You can also check out exclusive content on Hulu Plus. Uh, there's The Wrong Mans, it's, I'm not mispronouncing that, and there's also Behind the Mask. I've watched the entire series of Behind the Mask. It's Hulu's new documentary series that takes you inside the world of sports mascots. I know that sounds a little weird, but if you ever go to a high school game, a college game, or whatever, this show actually looks at the lives of the people inside the suits. It's a really well put together show. They cover high school level, college level at UNLV, and even an NBA mascot who works for the Bucks. Lots of NBA footage in this. It's a spectacular show. I really do enjoy it. You also get access to a collection of ad free movies and kids content. So if you've got kids, really good for that. For only $7.99 a month, you can catch up on current shows, binge on old favorites, or catch a great movie. Stream as many TV shows and movies as you want, wherever you want, because the app's pretty much everywhere. And right now, you can try out Hulu Plus free for two weeks when you go to huluplus.com slash knowhow. That's a special offer for our audience. Make sure you use huluplus.com slash knowhow so you get the extended free trial, and they know we sent you. We thank Hulu Plus for their support of Twit, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Hulu Plus. So many shows I watch on this thing. I know. Never have to worry well, about scheduling. It's, it's just packed. I mean, that's that's where you go to find your content if you don't want to go ahead and organize every DVD. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, as as I am a lazy guy, I've got a quick tip for you guys. Do you use Chrome? Bobby? I do all the time. That's do you want to save choice. like millions of seconds per day? Let's do that, please. Let's show this quick tip. As is a theme of all of my quick tips and pretty much anything I do on Know How, I am a lazy, lazy man or an efficiency expert, depending on who you're talking to, uh, considering I talk to myself, probably both. So today I'm going to show you some qu a quick tip on Google Chrome, how to do some uh, little tricks so you can save a lot of time. I'm going to show you how I get to the TNT doc every day. So what I would do is I'd open a new tab and i type in TNT. Oh, watch. It's going to load. Watch the amazingness, and boom, it loads in. Now, why do I get to just type in TNT? Now, it's a keyword. What I'm actually using is a, not, I wouldn't even call it a hack. I'm just using a feature that's built into Chrome that's for search engines, but you can use them as shortcuts too. So I'll show you how that works. So here is a Google Drive document that I have that's available publicly. Now, if you go to this, it's docs.google.com slash spreadsheet slash TCC question mark, and it goes on forever. Now, I don't want to bookmark this because then I have to go through folders and stuff. I don't care for that. So we're going to use a keyword. So we're going to copy this URL, this whole URL right here. We're going to go into our settings. We're going to go into Manage Search Engines. I know you're like, this is a search engine? No, it's not a search engine. We're going to use the search engine keyword as a trick. So we're going to type in horror pairings. And the keyword will be HP X, because we're extreme. Also, I might have HP for Hewlett Packard. I don't know that for sure. So I'm going to type that in, hit Done. If I open a new tab and type in HP X, it should load the horror pairings doc, and there it is. Now, 
why does this work? If you go into the settings again, I'll show you why this works. All I'm taking advantage of is a built-in search engine function that what you do here says URL with percentage S in place of the variable. That's what it's usually looking for. So you can have any custom search engine you want, but if you don't put that value in, if you don't put percentage S in there, it's just going to act like a keyword. And this will propagate on anywhere you're actually signed into Chrome. So it's pretty dang fast. So if I signed into another machine and typed in my shortcuts like KH2 for know-how, the doc should load right now, and I don't have to remember the URL, which is like docs.google.com slash spreadsheet slash question marks. Like, I don't want to remember that. It just takes far too long. That's one thing to do with Google Chrome. And I think it'll save you hundreds and thousands of seconds per day if you constantly do what I do, which is constantly forgetting what I'm closing and, and everything. So that's your little quick tip for Chrome. Uh, I'm Ayaz Akhtar, not quite a keyboard ninja, but lazy, lazy man. Yeah, so that tip does work on Chrome. It does sync up across things. Somebody was saying in the chat room, that TNT doc loads up slow. It does, actually, every day, even when I'm wired in, because it's a massive document with lots of information. Uh, if you've ever seen the TNT show notes, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, go take a look at twit.tv slash TNT. We've got some awesome stuff there. But what if people wanted to find out stuff about this show, Robert, what should they do? Well, you know, the first thing they're going to want to do is they're going to want to contact us. And they, they should. Could, they could get us through our email, which is just knowhow at twit.tv. Go ahead and write us, ask us about what, what happened on an episode, ask us for future episodes, ask us for clarification. We're here to help you. Yeah, just don't ask us for money. No. That's not going to happen. No. Nope. But if you want our show notes and you want to know, hey, what did, what were the actual materials we used on anything we've ever built or anything, and you want to see maybe, maybe you're bored and you're like, I need some projects. I want to do some stuff. Go to twit.tv slash kh. All of our show notes are there. We've got over, I think it's around, this is our 70th episode. So we've got lots and lots of projects right for you. We've got that awesome Raspberry Pi MAME that all three of us worked on putting this together, there's a picture of it, and I think Brian still has it and uh, is enjoying it greatly. So far, it hasn't set itself on fire? Not yet. Not yet, says Brian. And I should note, we take pride in our show notes. They are the best show notes in the business. I mean, if you want to know how we did any of these projects, mm -hmm. go there and we give you detailed instructions, links to where you could buy this stuff, pretty much everything that we have in our doc, everything that we had to get in order to, uh, to make all the research for our projects, we give to you in an easy to understand format. Yeah, so if, you, if you, like, I don't want to watch the video, you can read the notes. We've you got could. it all covered we, for you. We've got cliff notes. Unless there's something that's just so visual, like setting something on fire. Uh, if you go to Twitter, <laughs> though, and you want to send us a little comment, use the hashtag TwitKH. What's the thing for hashtag? Is it this? Hashtag. When I'm doing Diamond Club. Yeah, hashtag. hashtag. And, uh, you know, we're not just on Twitter. You can also find us on Google+. Plus. You just go ahead and uh, jump over to gplus.to slash twitkh. You'll be able to find a community that's, that's actually really vibrant. I think we're almost at 5,000 users. Almost, And they yeah. post pretty regularly. It just always reminds me of old school forums. So yeah. much interaction going on yes. there. Padre, you're in there all the time, writing back and forth with lots of different ideas, show ideas being publicly uh, discussed. Great stuff over our Google Plus community. I enjoy it from time to time. I'm like, whoa, what's this idea? Great idea, great idea, quick tip. It's, just, it's a great resource for all kinds of things. Have any idea? Oh, next week, we've got a scheduling note. Next week, we'll be celebrating Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah, we're gobble, gobble, turkey. So we'll be eating turkey. So you, we'll, have, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Don't worry. You can always get, go back to twit.tv slash kh and get other episodes if you haven't seen them. Yeah, you know, you probably haven't watched the entire stable of know-how shows, so go back and find a project that you want to do over your Thanksgiving break, mm -hmm. just in case you don't want to set fire to your home with thermocouples. You can marathon them. There you go. You can, have, you can binge watch know-how while you binge on turkey. Yes, please. Okay, anyway. I think that does it for us. Now you know how to set fire to things and get power off of them. You should go do it. With the fire extinguisher, be safe. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Double, double.